Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. We sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Carstairs Alberta Councillor Angie Frick. But before we get into today's episode, I just want to ask you to do a favor for us. If you want to join our growing list of supporters, please head over to the Cross Border Interviews website at www.crossborderinterviews.ca and pledge your support today. For as little as $3 a month, you can help make municipal issues matter again. Thank you so much. Now, on to our interview. Angie, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to talk about yourself and talk about the town of Carstairs. I want to start with talking about you, though, and I want to start with the general question, but it's the basis of what this whole interview is about, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Angie? Thanks, Chris. I, I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation to participate. Um, I love the content that you do. I think you bring a very valuable um, perspective to the world of politics when everything is so polarizing and divisive. I think it's nice to have um, just this positive all-encompassing like holistic opportunities to hear all sides so I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing um so in terms of my background um I have always had a, an interest in politics I, like I follow all levels of politics pretty closely um and so growing up my parents always instilled a very like strong sense of community service uh into us and uh particularly my mom enrolled me in probably every single community group and organization. And, and at the time you just you just roll your eyes at that and you know, I don't want to go to Air Cadets today or I don't want to go to Junior Forest Wardens or something like that. But looking back now, um, it really did such a huge impact on the way that I was brought up and kind of who I am as a person today. Um, and so just being involved in the community at such a young age, just, you know, always willing to help somebody out at a time of need, I think was just something that really resonated with me. And um I think the the turning point for when I got involved, decided to run uh, with car stairs, the opportunity has kind of presented itself to me and I, and I took hold of it. But um, I'm a firm believer that there's always like there, there's a book that changes your life. And so there's two books that I've read that have immensely changed my life. And uh, this one particular book um, talks about like coincidences, which like I personally don't believe in coincidences, but when a coincidence keeps on presenting itself, it's it's a message for you just to kind of take action on it. And that's just um, what kind of pushed me just to venture into the world of municipal politics. So I want to go back to your upbringing a little bit, because you, you mentioned your mom and dad and how you were active in politics and you you kind of followed politics was politics discussed at the dinner table was and when i asked that question i preface it by saying was municipal politics discussed at the dinner table growing up or was it traditionally like everyone else who i talked to federal and provincial politics um so my my mom had um my mom is semi-retired now, but she's had a pretty unique career. She was a a journalist with a bunch of uh, newspapers, and so she had to follow everything. And so I remember going to all these community events. Uh, I grew up in Cochrane and I moved to Sundry, so, um, and then now in Carsters, obviously. But um, my mom always brought up, she would talk about the stuff that she was working on. So um, in particularly, if I'm thinking about pre teenage Angie I don't particularly remember a specific topic but I just I always remember my mom always keeping us up to date on current events and in all levels do you remember what those two books are before we get into the uh the uh sort of your time on council for the last two years what were those two books that you were reading that sort of pivoted you towards that final decision in 2021 to put your name on that ballot for sure. So the first book I read um, is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Um, that one just really instilled like a sense of calm uh, in me. It just made me realize um, just just to take a step back, just to be calm, just to observe how things are unfolding and and eventually like everything corrects itself. Um, the second one I read, and this is the one that kind of pushed me into run into municipal, um, was the Celestine Prophecy. And I believe that was written in the 80s. And that's the one that talks about coincidences and, and, and a journey and um, uh, just very, very impactful books. 
So I want to talk about the 2021 election because I, I did a little bit of research on you because I traditionally try not to do a lot because I want to learn like my listeners are from my guest and I don't want to come in with a prepared set of questions. Had this been the first time you thought about running for political office in 2021 or was it in the back of your head that you said maybe one day, I just don't know when that exact time was and until the quinces started showing up, that's when I said, okay, maybe this is the year, maybe this is the election that I'm going to finally do it and pull the trigger and put my name on the ballot. Uh, yes, 2021 was the first time that I ever tangibly thought about putting my name on the ballot before then I was always just very um it, it's very easy to, to bitch and complain um sorry I don't know if you can bleep that out but it's very easy to bitch and complain about things and um I don't I, I, I like people that come to me with with not only the problem but a solution and so it's like I don't want to be just the person that's negative and complaining like I think it's an opportunity to learn how things are actually done and, and be part of something and that's not saying that that I was bitching and playing about Carsters at, at all um that was just you know federal provincial everything you know it's it's like I said things are very it, there's a lot of informational there right now was it an easy decision for yourself to say municipal is where I think I would best be able to serve because you could have chosen federal, you could have chosen provincial, you could have even chosen school board at that time, but you at the end of the day chose municipal. What was the allure of municipal politics for you? Uh, the allure to me is just municipal. Like, like I live there, you know, yeah. I, I get to see my streets being cleaned. I get to see the garbage pickup. I get to see a playground being built or you know, things like that. And um, all of those governments serve their purpose, but I feel that the higher up it goes, the, the more disconnected you become from the people. Um, and so uh, I just, I like like to serve in my community and I don't want to be disconnected. And so that's that was the draw to me for municipal. So you've been on municipal council for two years now. You're just passing actually your two year mark uh, as of recording this a few days ago. So I've got to ask the semi million dollar question: Was it what you expected? Because you, this, the town of Carstairs has gone through some big things over the last few years, particularly this summer with a massive a tornado coming through, not mm -hmm. in the community, but in the surrounding areas, which probably concerns a lot of people. So for you, being on the front lines, being the person who's at the table making the decisions, was it what you expected? I don't know what I thought I expected, but I think <laughs> because there's so much uh, media highlights on provincial and federal that I think that that kind of skews what you're expecting when you go into any level of politics. And so going into municipal, um, I didn't run on a particular like project or platform, um, sorry, platform's the wrong word. I didn't run on a particular project um, or goal. What I ran on was the skills that I can offer um, because I don't, I don't know how how the town operates so I thought it would be very misleading to run with some kind of thing like that if I couldn't deliver um getting in everyone there has been absolutely amazing and I think the thing that that people sometimes just don't know is, is that you really are truly like an independent you know you serve you know all levels you're you're non-partisan and so that's something that I absolutely love so um I think uh it's been better than what I expected I want to talk about the jurisdictional roles because you brought it up here during the during the election when you were door knocking when you were talking to your neighbors to your uh, uh, co-workers to anyone in your community who would want to talk to you about the issues that are facing them what were you hearing were they more municipal issues or were there a blurring of jurisdictional lines where someone would be talking to you about education and you know that municipalities don't have a role in education they look at the zoning and planning of where the school should go but at the end of the day you don't have any control over what goes on in the school or were they talking about healthcare, which is more of a provincial issue or were they talking about passports which is more of a federal issue were they talking about municipal issues did was there an understanding from your perspective of the jurisdictional roles of a municipality uh so um like like as you're aware like during alberta's 2021 election it was also the federal election so i maybe got one particular question 
um, when I was door knocking um, and it was more about street cleaning, like snow removal. That was it. Everything else was who, who was I voting for in the federal election? Um, a lot of COVID questions or I guess opinions. Um, that was it. So I think it, it was so there's so much media on those other levels of politics that that municipal kind of there's not a whole lot of attention on it. What about now? We're two years in. When you're at the grocery store, do you hear from people? Do people come up to you and say, Angie, I have an issue. We need to chat about it right now. Are are people stopping you and talking about the issues that are facing the town today? Uh, yeah, I've had people approach me um, and I absolutely welcome that. I really enjoy that. Um, I think where we are right now, you know, like we are a growing community. We're in the top 20 fastest growing uh, communities in Alberta. So that is something that that we are facing. And I think with with growth obviously comes um, a little bit of, of growing pains, essentially. But um, nothing, no particular issue comes up that that's earth shattering but um you know definitely approachable and definitely having those good discussions out about in the community you you sit around a table and you make decisions on a weekly basis or a semi-weekly basis because i know that you don't meet every week but you meet almost every week and the decisions you make impact your residents the day after you make them and that's a pretty big weight that you have to bear because you go out to your grocery store, people are going to know who you are, particularly in smaller communities like Carstairs. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure you're making the right decision that is going to make the biggest impact, but the least impact on the day-to-day -day lives of people who are potentially struggling, particularly with everything going on in the world right now? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, you're, you're elected to make those those hard decisions. Um, not everyone's going to like you. but uh, we, <laughs> you, you don't we say, make... Angie. Come on. Everyone yeah. loves a politician. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I, I, what you can do is is that you, you make the best decision you can with with the best information you have available. And that that's really just a guiding principle, you know, um, with the decisions decisions that I, I contribute to within the town. Are you willing to sit down and talk, listen to someone like we're doing right now, listen to someone who may not even just may not agree with the, the, the way that you voted on something, because there's a respect in the job that you have to give to the people because you're there, you're making the decisions and you have to respect someone who may disagree with you, but do it in a respectful manner. If they're yelling at you and swearing at you, then you say, well, maybe calm down and call me later. But is there respect that you have to give to the people who may disagree with you as well? Absolutely. Like, I, I would never want to live in a carbon copy world where everyone is just like me. Like, if that was like, for example, like my husband is an extrovert, I'm more of a extroverted introvert. Um, If I was married to somebody like me, I'd never leave the house. So, uh, so I love having those different conversations. I love having those different perspectives. I see those as, you know, moments that will challenge me and, but help me grow. You know, anything that comes with growth doesn't come without a little bit of, of, of pain or, or challenge. And so um, I, it's important to have uh, a respectful conversation. I 100% agree. I believe in servant leadership. I am here because the people voted for me. Um, but also when you have like an emotionally charged um, resident, there's a reason why why they're emotionally charged and it may not be the reason that they're coming at you at that moment but there's something feeding into that issue so I think it's incredibly important to even in instances like that as long as it's not uh, an immediate threat to yourself I, I think it's important to let them have that opportunity just to vent their their emotions and then you can move forward from there and sometimes it's just sitting there and just listening to them and just letting them know that, that, they, that they were heard. Now, you you are very active on social media, probably one of the more active uh, municipal politicians that I've seen in rural communities. Uh, and I say rural communities as in rural outside of the larger mm -hmm. two urban centers of Calgary and Edmonton. Why is that important for you? Because you, at the end of the day, have to make the decisions, but you're passing it on to them in a, in a very educational way, I may add. Why is that important for you to sort of be that lifeline to people, to get the information out there, to let people know what's going on at City Hall? Is it because you're not seeing the media landscape as you talked about, or is there another underlying circumstance of you saying, 
potentially in 2021 when you ran, I'm going to communicate with you. Good, bad, or indifferent, I'm going to let you know what's going on at City Hall. Um, I, I think uh, even when I was I, uh, leading up to when I started to run, I had always known that I was going to have some kind of like social media presence or platform. Um, social media is just another communication tool. And so um, that's how I look at it as. Um, and so um, one of the things that I had heard when I was door knocking, and this is just like Angie talking, this is just just what I heard, doesn't doesn't yeah. reflect anybody else. But what I had heard from a few people was that um, you come to our door every four years, and then we never hear from you again. <laughs> and so I just wanted to be able to um, give information that I think is relevant and and present it to them in somewhat of an educational way. Um, when I was starting to do the social media, because we've, we've all, most of us have, you know, use it for our own personal profiles. And so what you post personally is going to be different than what you post professionally. And so, you know, I like a lot of data. I like to know like the, the reason why. And I took this social media course because uh, I wasn't getting a whole lot of um, reactions to what I was posting. And so the coach had said, if you're posting something and nobody's reacting to it, it's not relevant to them. And so that was a little bit of like humble pie to eat and be like, okay, then I'm not giving something that these people want. So, you know, there's a lot of really active politicians out there right now. And so I, and I talked to quite a few of them and there's a great, I guess, un, um, unofficial kind of mentorship, you know, going on where you can kind of, you know, well, that was a great post that you did. I'm going to copy what you did. And so giving more of a community-based updates, I find are um, what people want more just based off of, you know, the reactions and, and the data I see. Um, before we turn to the segment two, I want to finish on this. Um, engagement in communities, I find, and this is my opinion, is at an all-time low. Um, probably about 10, 15 years ago, you would be hard pressed to find a council meeting where a few people didn't show up, like maybe five or six or seven or eight who were actually involved. Now it's hard to come across a municipality where people are actually attending city council meetings or council meetings. Um, in your time as a municipal councillor, are you seeing there an apathy in your community when it comes to the issues that are facing your community? Like when you ask people for their opinion, are they willing to give their opinion, their honest, unabarred opinion on certain issues? So that way it gives you better understanding of what people think and then makes it easier for you to make a decision around that council table. Or are people just happy, as you said, as long as my water's turned on and my garbage is picked up, that's all I care about municipal politics. Um, so I think with that one, yeah, I actually I actually looked at the um electoral turnout for uh federal federal, provincial, and then car stairs, uh just to see what we were at. And so I believe the federal was around I think it was like 56, province was 64, and then a car stairs, I think we were between 33 and 36 percent um and so when you look at the bigger cities we were we had a higher voter turnout than the bigger cities but when you compare us with some of the other ones you know we were lower and so um I think there is I think no matter what there's a little bit of uh voter apathy I think also having two elections within what was it like two weeks was I think people were just done um and so I think where the media attention comes and draws all the all the people's attention to like like that's where you that's where you're gonna put your efforts as a voter right if you don't hear anything from something else then you're, it's not gonna get the same attention um so i hope that answers the question it, it does it does it does and i want to turn to my second segment now because i am cautious of time here um and i want to talk about the town as a whole but before I ask this question, as you know, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not even a direction of council. This is just the councillor's opinion. So in your opinion, Angie, councillor, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Carstairs today as of recording this episode? Uh, so, um, in my opinion, what I see um, is, you know, now that we have essentially hit our 5,000 um, population uh, level, um, you know, policing is something that we have to have set up. So I think policing is going to be something that we're going to be really focused on. 
Um, as with all municipalities, I think also um, drawing more businesses into our community and expanding our tax base would be something that that I would consider. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, like we're we're among the top twenty fastest growing communities in Alberta, um, and I think maintaining that authentic small town feeling. Um, because right we want to be like a community of communities and just you know have that sense of sense of one so so that that would be what I would consider the top three in my opinion is that hard is that hard to maintain that sort of sense of community when you are growing at a fast pace because being one of the top 20 communities that is growing in Alberta that comes with some struggles that comes with some changes to the makeup of a community for you looking at the day-to-day -day issues that you're presented in front of in council. Is it hard to make those changes, but still try to keep that sense of community and sense of small town feel while understanding that growth is coming? I think it is. Um, because I, th I think you have people that never want to see anything change. You have people Nimbyism that want to see is live change. and well, Angie. Yeah. What? <laughs> I know, mind blown. Um, but I uh, change isn't bad. Um, and so I, I, th I think just being as as upfront and honest about you know the decisions that we're making are are what's important. I think that's what can that can bring some calm to people as as we continue to grow. You, you talk about growth and growth comes with a price tag because uh, as much as we don't think it does, it always does. Because growth means infrastructure upgrades. That means infrastructure repairs. That means expansion of infrastructure, wastewater treatment facilities, more service levels on the already existing service levels that you have. And that comes with a hefty price tag. And I got to ask, um, while you know that municipalities can't run deficits, you have to try and figure out how to do this in a sustainable way that it's not on the back of residents. You're heading into a budget cycle, I'm assuming, or you've already started your 2024 capital operating budget. How do you see your role as councillor in striking a balance between the growth of the city and the needs and wants of your residents and the realities of budgets? Absolutely. So, so, so you're correct. We will be heading into, into budget uh, discussion soon um you know we've been we have you know a very diligent you know administration team that um does great work and has been able to help you know keep our keep our expenses and mill rate you know um quite quite conservative um which i, th I think people appreciate um our infrastructure is great like like we probably have one of the um most up to date and well maintained uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure is not sexy. That's the thing. People, you know, a pool is sexy, but you know your wastewater your, treatment facility is not yeah. sexy, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> not as sexy. So, um, I think when you're looking at infrastructure in particularly, I think um, you have to let people know why that's important because everyone sees something like like a, like a pool or something like that is just like great and they get excited over that um but if if one day you're say you're flushing your toilet and it doesn't go anywhere that's a big deal so i think it comes down to just just educating um on the budget deci decisions to to the residents so education is great but that balance that you have to strike be is you're there to represent the entire town you're there as a counselor to represent the community and you have to put the best needs of the entire community over top of the individual needs and wants as well. But sometimes you have to remember that individual issues matter. And if I go talk to a hundred people in car stairs today, I'm assuming, and I, I hate to assume, but I'm guessing that there's going to be a hundred different issues that people bring to my attention, whether it be even in the provincial realm, federal realm, municipal realm, maybe it'd be a park, maybe it'd be a swimming pool, maybe it'd be pothole in front of my house. Where's the balance that you have to strike to make sure people do feel like their issues are being solved, but understanding that the greater good, the greater community has to come first in addressing the future growth of your community? That's a great question. Um, one thing that my mom had always said to me is, is your perception is your reality. Um, so if if your issue today is that, you know, you want spruce trees and all the in all the you know community spaces rather than 
evergreens or some something like that at that moment like like that is your pressing issue that that is your, your perception is your reality so i think um everybody deserves to be heard uh, as elected official you know I, we owe it to the people that voted us in um to give them the time to be heard um gather the information so that when, when we do go into that those budget cycles we can make the decisions based off of the information that we have and based off of the feedback of the residents is it hard is it hard to try to be you, you you mentioned earlier that you can't please 100% of the people which is true and i, I kind of joked about it but you want to you you're there to make people feel good about their community you're there to make people happy that they live in their community is it hard to say to people your issue is not that important right now maybe next year maybe when we have a little bit more money because this area of the town needs a little bit more attention compared to your area is it hard to say no to people particularly in a line of field where if you say no that means they could vote against you next election uh, I don't think it's hard for me particularly it's not hard for me to say no um if I have the right information I can I can make the right decision um I believe but um, I think it's just human nature that 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 you do want to please people. I um, I'd be hard pressed to find something that, that somebody that doesn't want to please people or doesn't want to be liked. So um, there, there's times where it's uncomfortable, a hundred percent. I will I will say that. But um, making those decisions, sometimes saying no, is not that difficult for me. And at the end of the day, if if the population decides that they don't want me to serve a second term, then that's that's just what it is. Now, I have been accused on this show that I've been very negative in the issues category segment of this show. So I have to change it up a little bit here. And I want to just put a sort of a open-ended question to you here, uh, Councillor. And that is, while there's issues that come with every municipality, there's always the accomplishments. There's always the things that people look to and don't really get celebrated enough. For you, for the last two years on council, what can you look back on or what can you look to the future and say, you know, what's coming down the pipeline? This project, and this is going to make our community better. What are the accomplishments of Carstairs in your time in office or potentially during uh, the next few years in the future? Well, that's a good one. Um <laughs> I know. I, I feel bad because I got I got called out by it by uh, Brazo County uh, uh, Councillor Tara uh, Westerlund. And she goes, you always talk about negative. I was like, oh, sorry. Now I have to talk about the positive. So let's talk about the positives for a bit. So what are some of the accomplishments of your community that you 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 can point to over the last two years or into the future? Um. So I think, uh, you know, obviously when I came in, it was just at the end of um covid um so i think things were rather quiet um leading leading up to, up to the new council term um so some of those things that we've done we have a very active uh volunteer community base in carstairs uh you know we we are getting four pickleball courts um that seems to be a very um popular sport i think across across alberta probably potentially across the country um so that's something something unique that we have um some other things that we've done, you know, we have an immense, you know, walking path system that, that's all connected. Um, that's something else that, that I'm quite proud of. And this one is not this one is not particularly done because of us, but I just wanted to highlight it. Um, so in Carsters, we have the Carsters Nature Space, um, and it's brought together by, you know, through partnership with the town and and uh, the Carsters, I believe the Egg Society and then the Nature Space um, volunteers. And uh a, a wonderful residence actually made a, a significant contribution um, this year and they built um, a, a essentially like a gazebo outside. And so it's for the whole public to use. So those would be the things that I think um, are the biggest um, attractive issues. You know, infrastructure is not attractive, like I said, but these are the things that people can see, see and, and, and use that I think would be the most, uh, most standoffish in my mind. Looking forward to the next two years, you you have a lot of things probably on your plate as a councillor, as this council of uh, Carstairs. And while it's still two years away, and you're, I'm, I'm assuming you're not even thinking about that election, but let's not talk about that election. But I want to ask, 
if the first two years have been sort of a learning experience for yourself and getting the to know the ropes, what does the next two years look like for you on council? Are are you do you have sort of a thing or an issue that you want to try to accomplish over the next two years, or are you just letting things go as they are because you're happy the way that the count the town is moving forward? Um, I think now that the two years have come. Um, I don't feel quite as like deer in headlights, um, <laughs> which I I quite welcome now because I feel like I feel like I'm remembering things. Like we were talking about um, wastewater the other day, and there was a question asked, and then in my head I was like, oh, I know this answer. So there's things that now that I'm I'm like okay, I'm, I'm like knowing this. I'm getting into a good groove. I found a a good system that organizes my thoughts and and everything. So I'm feeling very um, centered in terms of the balance with with uh with managing the council role um so for over the next two years um i just want to continue to learn as much as i can um and like i said you know like, like policing is, is is a big thing so that's something i think will take take a bit of my focus and then of course you know um the growth like like, like really just, just making sure that we we stay somewhat you know centered on our identity of of who we are as carsters as as an entity so can I ask you what do you mean by policing? Because I'm assuming, I, I, I would guess that Carstairs is under the policing of the RCMP, correct? Or are you correct? So yeah, so um so right now uh, one of our neighboring communities, so their detachment polices we're within their detachment policing area. And so under um I believe it's under federal regulations. Once you hit 5,000 people, then you have to have a detachment of your own. So, that, so that's what we're looking at. So, are you looking at all options? And I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. And if you want me, if you want me to move on, just tell me to move on. But are you looking at all options? Because this is a fascinating conversation. Because I'm actually chatting with Minister McIver later on this afternoon, literally the day that we're recording this. So, this is going to be okay. an excellent question that I could ask him. Are you looking at potentially all options, RCMP, potentially even uh, community police officers like Grand Prairie is doing, like a town police force, or are you just looking solely at RCMP right now? Or are those conversations um, even started? Yeah, so the conversations have been have have been happening. So so our uh, our two of the people on council are actually um uh, have police service backgrounds. So they've brought a wealth of information uh, that is great to have. So um, in particular, in, in particularly, and this has been shared um, with, with the media and everything, is that, you know, we'd be looking kind of like potentially like a, like a regional uh, policing um, okay. approach. And so that that would be, um, I, I believe would be like the first option that we'd be looking for. Perfect. Thank you for that honesty and that answer. I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time and I, it's my favorite subject because I like visiting people. I like visiting communities. <laughs> I like exploring hidden gems in Canada. So as a tourist who's about to come to Car Stairs probably in the next week or so, but by the time this airs, I will have already been there. What should I do in Car Stairs? What should I be looking for besides the amount of snow that we've gotten over the last two days? What are some of the hidden yeah. gems in Car Stairs? <laughs> Yeah, the snow, it's been lovely. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll tell you, my my commute yesterday to work was quite fun. I um I work I work in Calgary and so I, I timed it. it took me 18 minutes to drive three kilometers. It was lovely. <laughs> oh. So anyway, um something positive now. So um if if I were to tour you around car stairs, um I would probably if I if I were to have you in the summer, I'd probably bring you to um, our Carstairs, Her Carstairs Heritage Festival. Um, our sister town is in Scotland. So we have a whole play on like strongman competitions. Um, we have a parade of kilts. I believe we had eight or nine different pipe bands in that uh, parade this year. Um, I'd probably then take you off to our um, you know, we have an animal shelter in town. They run a show and shine that's actually on the provincial uh, tourist docket with the show and shine organization. I'd probably bring you to that. And while you're at it, you could pet some puppies and, you know, maybe take one home. And then uh, if it's in December, um, I'd tell you to bring your long underwear and I'd probably bring you out to Carcer's Crazy Christmas. We shut down the main street. There are fire pits all along main street. Businesses stay open. 
uh, rather late. You could do all your Christmas shopping. You can get some hot chocolate, um, get your picture with Santa and, uh, you know, maybe do a, do a hayride. So that would probably be what I would take you to for an event based. Um, in terms of, you know, we have a lot of really like artisan based businesses. So if you're looking for stuff that's really unique, we have that. We have um, businesses that kind of run on a, um, not like a, I can't remember the word right now. We, one of the businesses is, is, is um, oh, I can't remember the word at all. Anyways, oh, like a farmer's market, sorry. Oh. So we have a couple more like that. So you could get some really like produce local, support local things there. Um, and then, uh, you know, our library is absolutely fantastic. They do so many great drop-in programs, educational programs, free to people. So um, those would probably be the key highlights I would take you to. Where do you go in town? Where do you go after a long day of work, where you are right now? Where do you go after a long day of council meetings to just recenter yourself, to realize that after a long day, you're going to have to get back at it tomorrow morning, no matter what, and be the best counselor, be the best person you can be to help your community grow and help your community overcome some challenges that it may be facing. Where's your sort of recenter space? For sure. So as I said, I'm an extroverted introvert. So <laughs> you're gonna say your house, um, aren't you? <laughs> I no, but I, I will I will expand. So um I am I am a I am, sorry, I'm an early bird. Like I wake up very, very early. So I hit the gym usually around 5 a.m. Um so my place to decompress would probably be our local gym. You know, it's a place that's like just for me, it starts my day off good and um it, it is a positive contribution to myself. Um, I will say um, probably the, the best thing that ever came through COVID for myself was just seeing what a work-life balance actually looks like. And so that was something that, I, that I've carried forward from that is just making sure I allot that time to myself because that helps me, you know, clear my mind, be positive and be the best version of myself. So I'd say our local gym, if I'm looking for something to eat and, and maybe some drinks, I'd probably stop at the Twisted Lizard in town. Um, it's a very, very fun, unique restaurant. Um, uh, Villa Maria, uh, award-winning Italian place. I'd probably, you know, enjoy some lasagna there. And then our local, you know, Barley's Pub, you know, it, it's it's a, it's a staple of, of Main Street. I'd probably go there for, for wing night or, or, you know, maybe a pint or something. You mentioned something. I was going to ask it in the first segment, but I was cautious of time. But if you have two minutes, I would love to ask this question. You talk about a work-life balance, and I can imagine that is probably crucial to a small-town municipal leader like yourself, because you don't go off to Edmonton to do your job as an MLA. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job as an M MP. You are in your community 24-7. So when you run to the grocery store, you're a counselor. When you go to the gym, even though it's early in the morning, you're the counselor. Have you struck that balance where you can say, there's days when I can just be Angie and there's days that I know I have to be counselor? Or is every single time you leave your house, you know, no matter where you are, you could be stopped at a moment's notice and people may ask you questions about what's going on in the community and you have to respond to them? Yes. So, so my, my home would be, would be like my solitude. So, so, so that, that's where I truly am just like myself, like where I'm just Angie, I can bring up my Kindle, my blankets, cuddle with the dogs. Um, because, because I live local, um, in a small town, um, I, I try to present the best version of myself whenever I'm out of the public. Um, I think that's what something I would, I would expect of, a, of an elected person. So I try to just dis, disconnect myself in the way that I would expect someone else to, if, if that makes sense. It, it does. And I appreciate that. So I want to turn to my last question now, and it's the million dollar question I ask on this show to every single municipal leader, because I think it's an important question. And I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it. It just want to put it on the record for people to hear 10 years, 15 years down the line. In your opinion, what makes the town of Carstairs such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? That's an excellent question. Um, I will tell you why I chose Carstairs, and then I will expand on that to kind of explain um, what we have there. So, um, as I said, um, I lived in Cochrane, and then I moved to Sundry, and I lived in Sundry till I was 22. Um, and 
after I got out of college, I was still living in Sundry and I was uh, doing emergency response planning updates for uh, 12 oil and gas companies within the area. Carstairs was within the, the, the ERP zone. And so I had I had four or five different counties that were involved in that bunch of towns all the way from like Caroline um, down to Crossfield. And I kid you not, Carstairs was the only area where no one threatened me, yelled at me um, or swore at me. So it left a really, really positive impression on me from my work there. Um, when I got my got my job in Calgary, I was commuting from Sundry to Calgary. And that was a terrible, there was no life balance there. And so, um, you know, Carstairs was still at the back of my mind, looked into it, and it was a reasonable commuting distance. And so that's why we chose it. So I just wanted to highlight just the impression of the people that left on me because that goes into, you know, what we have now. And really, I think what makes Carstairs so great is really our people. You know, we have an incredible volunteer base. You mentioned the tornado. Um, I was home when that tornado hit. Um, it was crazy to see. It looked like it was coming into town. Luckily, it was just just north of town. Um, it unfortunately did impact a, lo a lot of families. A lot of families lost yeah. everything. Um, but the way that the community came out to support those impacted, I've I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. Like there was people that were offering childcare and like coming with horse trailers to grab their cat, their cattle and their and their horses. You know, there were people from like literally everywhere bringing food and clothing and you know just being there for support. And so um, uh, I know me and, and quite a few of the counselors did, did some cleanup, and it was just just seeing that community come together. Um, uh, like I hope I never ever experience or nobody experiences something like that again, like the, like the tornado. But just seeing how the community came together to support you all, like their own, is really what I think makes our our community great. It is, it's a people like we're a triple A plus gold star I think level of people in this community. Angie, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule. I, I know you're doing this at work, so thank you, Tate, for taking time out of your work schedule to do this. But also, I want to say thank you. Thank you for serving your community. I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough, and I think it's high time that we do, because you deal with a lot of issues on a weekly basis. And any normal person probably would have just quit by now, but you're still doing it after two years. So thank you for stepping up, and thank you for being part of a community that wants better for the next generation and for today so thank you so much thank you so much chris for those um those very kind words i appreciate it um thank you for the opportunity and offering a platform um just to kind of bring broader awareness to, to municipal politics which is something um as i've said i think throughout this entire interview that th there's a lack of 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 information and publicity on on municipal politics so thank you so much Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.